very happy to, 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 to be with you this morning. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to chair this um, meeting. I want to welcome first um, the, the civil society petitioner of this hearing. Um, they, at, 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 the, at the time, they will be able to present themselves, and we would appreciate that you present with your names and the organizations that you represent. This is uh, hearing number two, and this has to do with the um, violations of uh, Venezu migrant, Venezuelan migrants, um, violations to rights of Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad and, to and Tobago. And uh, we regret very much that uh, the representative of the state of Trinidad and Tobago is not here. And uh, this is a lost opportunity for the representatives of the, of the state because one of the most important uh, purposes of these hearings is to listen both parties. And we will not have the second party. It's not possible to have a, a feedback on the issue that is being considered by the, by the commission. So I really regret that. However, I do want to recognize the civil society uh, petitioner of this hearing um, for bringing this matter to the attention of the commission. For the commission, uh, it's very important to follow up the humanitarian uh, crisis that, is, that the Venezuelan people are suffering. And when we are, have to deal with the um, situation of human rights of Venezuelans in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, that, that is part of our uh, concern as well. So um, before I give the floor to the, to the civil society, let me introduce the podium. Um, están aquí conmigo, en primer lugar, la comisionada Antonia eh, Urrejola. Eh, la comisionada es eh, relatora para eh, Trinidad y Tobago, eh, entre otras responsabilidades. También está con nosotros el comisionado Luis Ernesto Vargas. El comisionado Vargas es el relator para eh, eh, migrantes. Y también está aquí presente el comisionado Francisco eh, Eguiguren, entre otras responsabilidades, es el relator para eh, personas defensoras de derechos humanos y, e independencia eh, este, judicial. Nos acompaña también eh, la señora María Claudia Pulido, la secretaria ejecutiva adjunta. Me corresponde presidir esta, esta reunión en mi carácter de primer vicepresidente de la, de la comisión. Y voy eh, a dar la palabra a la sociedad civil. No tenemos límite de tiempo, eh, más que la, pro, la, la hora que dura esta audiencia. Y e iré manejando el tiempo con mucha flexibilidad, simplemente indicándoles cuando nos estemos acercando a la hora. Lo importante de esta oportunidad es escucharlos a ustedes. Eh, queremos nosotros tener toda la información posible que nos va a permitir llevar a cabo el monitoreo de la situación que traen a nuestra atención. Dicho esto, eh, profesora Belantuan, tiene usted la palabra. Good morning, esteemed commissioners. The Human Rights Clinic, Faculty of Law, University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, and the Family Planning Association of Trinidad and Tobago, thank you for this important hearing. I am Rosemary Antoine, and with me are Priya Kassoon and Do Donna Da Costa Martinez. The delegation also includes students Maris Ayong, Ajay Miraj, and Hannah Edwards Hilton. Trinidad and Tobago is the closest island to Venezuela, and in the last two to three years has experienced a dramatic increase in migrants fleeing Venezuela due to the political and economic crisis there. Many migrants seek asylum, while others remain as undocumented migrants. Our delegation contends that several human rights violations are occurring because of the failure of Trinidad and Tobago to put in place adequate, coherent, legal policy and administrative frameworks to treat effectively and humanely with the huge numbers of Venezuelan migrants entering its borders. Instead of formulating a humanitarian response to support this vulnerable group, the state has decreased previous protection measures, such as waivers of security bonds and orders of supervision, meant to be alternatives to detention. 
existing protections are being diminished without any or appropriate substitution. The state is failing to incorporate or implement international rights standards on migrants and asylum seekers as derived from various sources. Trinidad and Tobago acceded to the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees and the UN Convention on Migrant Workers. Articles 125 and 27 of the American Declaration on Rights, the ICCPR, UNICEF and CEDAW conventions are also relevant here. This perpetuates the violation of several fundamental rights. As a dualist state, incorporation into domestic law is required for treaties to have direct effect, but it is well established that ratifying states have obligations to bring the treaties into effect by adapting their domestic law in order to ensure conformity. To date, this has not occurred, such that the state is in breach of its treaty obligations. Treaty norms should also be recognized where there are gaps in existing legislation, a principle the Trinidad courts have recognized in other areas, but not for migrants and refugees. Treaties also invoke legitimate expectations. Instead, the state continues to enforce the Archaic Immigration Act, which contains no provision for asylum seekers or human rights standards for migrants, ignoring the 1951 Convention and other treaties it has ratified, and forcing migrants into illegality. Refugee processes are handled by external actors, UNHCR and an NGO, Living Water. As clarified in the advisory opinion on child migrants, though states have a margin of discretion when determining their immigration policies, they are obliged to respect the human rights of all persons within their jurisdiction, including migrants, because they are based on the attributes of the human personality, irrespective of nationality, whether the person is there temporarily or in an irregular migratory situation. A 2014 national policy on refugees and asylum seekers, which follows the 1951 convention, has not been implemented. This lack of appropriate legislation or policy hinders the application of adequate protection avenues for migrants and asylum seekers, with Venezuelans being disproportionately affected. These international obligations are either not understood or deliberately flouted. The state may also be characterized as arbitrary, uncertain, and harsh. There is little acknowledgement or awareness that migration and asylum regimes must be enveloped within a human rights framework. Consequently, uncertainty, disconnect, and incoherence permeate the administrative and judicial systems that confront Venezuelan migrants, which in turn exacerbate human rights violations. This lack of awareness filters down to the immigration, police, and even the judiciary, with reports of magistrates saying that they do not know what asylum means, thereby sentencing migrants automatically to jail. Just this week, the first case ever was won. Police tearing up asylum certificates, which are supposed to offer protection from deportation, seizing passports, and charging recognized refugees with illegal entry. Operating procedures agreed with the UNHCR are not followed. Policymakers have even made statements that the state has not ratified the 1951 convention, when indeed it has. The right to seek and receive asylum is enshrined as an individual human right, yet migrants and refugees are increasingly criminalized in Trinidad and Tobago. States are mandated to protect asylum seekers and irregular migrants from criminal prosecution. To quote Commissioner McCulley, irregular migration is not a crime nor is seeking asylum. The state's duty to avoid penalization of migrants and refugees, including prohibiting penalties such as detention, except as a last resort, is routinely breached. Large numbers of Venezuelans have been incarcerated in detention centers and even jails on remand for long period, e periods, even those seeking refugee status and possessing asylum certificates. This is a violation not only of migrant and asylum rights, but the rights of persons not to be deprived of liberty.
Such detentions are not, as required in international human rights law, necessary or proportionate in order to secure the appearance of the person at proceedings or to facilitate for the shortest time possible. Further, procedures and penalties are arbitrary. Some magistrates discharge, others detain for up to four years, others fine hefty fines up to $50,000. Bail also depends on family or social ties, which migrants do not have, and most cannot afford security bonds for release, which have been reintroduced in June 2018. Migrants are entitled to minimum due process guarantees, including proceedings to determine their status, detention reviews, hearings, translation, legal counsel, and appeals. However, the inconsistencies, legal and policy gaps result in an arbitrary, uncertain, and unfair environment for migrants, which mitigates against these due process rights in terms of administrative immigration and judicial processes. This, in turn, undermines their substantive rights. The process whereby UNHCR was allowed to make refugee status determinations is being undermined due to ad hoc detentions and deportations and clandestine operations. Decisions on deportation do not typically take into account required elements such as family ties and the humanitarian situation. Appeals or judicial review are often inaccessible. Further, immigration authorities often ignore their own processes for individualized reviews. A parliamentary committee confirmed the complaints that migrants are denied access to their attorneys and to the UNHCR and detention centers, preventing monitoring and their rights to legal representation and a fair trial. Core standards such as the principle of non refoulement are compromised, placing migrants at risk. Some were forced to sign compulsory consents or be jailed. There is increasing xenophobia against Venezuelans and evidence of ethnic profiling. This offends the principle of non-discrimination enshrined in all human rights treaties, a just cautions norm. The current paradigm exposes significant gender dimensions, accentuating the vulnerabilities of Venezuelan migrant women in the state. We contend that gender is structurally related to race, nationality, discrimination, whereby Venezuelan women are stereotyped. These gender intersections are particularly evident with regard to sexual violence and discrimination in an environment that offers little or no protection to Venezuelan women. Women and girls who are in truth trafficked persons continue to be identified as prostitutes and illegal migrants as opposed to victims needing state assistance and support. International standards on the rights of the child, their rights to family life, education, development, and not to be separated from parents are violated in relation to the children of Venezuela and migrants, many of whom are living in dangerous conditions without care and protection. The state's obligations to ensure that the society adopt the special measures of protection that all children require and to act in the best interest of the child are often ignored. The economic and social rights of Venezuelan migrants are being violated, in particular their rights to education, health and work, even when granted asylum. This is significant exploitation of Venezuelan nationals in the labor context because of the vulnerability of their economic and migrant status. Government introduced an amnesty through a two-week registration process to take effect May 31st to June 14, 2019, permitting illegal Venezuelan migrants to work for up to one year. While a step in the right direction, the amnesty is unclear in its scope and does not go far enough. It does not release the hundreds of detained migrants or provide a mechanism which would permit Venezuelans to claim asylum, nor does it provide for due process guarantees. It specifies limited health care, contradicting statements from the Minister of Health. It excludes rights to education and completely ignores gender variables and special protections for children. Above all, the prevailing climate of xenophobia, uncertainty, and fear makes it likely that many will be afraid to come forward. This is a necessary but insufficient solution. Officials estimate between 40 and 60,000 Venezuelans in Trinidad and Tobago with 10,000 asylum seekers. However, local residents imagine the figures to be much higher due to reports of hundreds of Venezuelans arriving every week, their conspicuousness in communities, 
and the daily barrage of news and social media discussing their criminality, sexuality, and illegality. Any scan of news headlines reveals the trope of illegality that stigmatizes Venezuelans in Trinidad. Even when a boat of about 30 people capsized a few weeks ago, with 23 women and children fair drowned, the press referenced them as illegal immigrants, as if being Venezuelan was synonymous with illegal, even though they had not landed. Some even celebrated the Venezuelans' deaths. There seems to be a generalized panic among citizens that the small twin island state will be submerged by Venezuela's fleeing population. The fear is exacerbated by rhetoric from some officials that describes Venezuelan migrants as flooding into the country or Venezuelan migration as a ticking time bomb. Protecting the border has included the unusual move of turning back scheduled ferries. When borders are enforced in a draconian manner, people simply take greater risks with more likelihood of exploitation, a pattern noted by the chief immigration officer who has said that the number of Venezuelans arriving to legal ports of entry has halved, while larger numbers are arriving illegally and being detained. Of the hundreds of people in immigration detention currently, 90% are Venezuelans, deprived of their freedom, their work, and their families. A third of Venezuelans arrived with family, and more than half of the family members were children. There are estimates of about 4,000 Venezuelan children in the country who are largely unprotected, and 15 to 17-year-old unaccompanied or separated children are of particular concern. A Venezuelan mother left her two children in the care of her parents so she could work in Trinidad, send back remittances, and offer them a better life. The young daughter ran away from her grandparents' home, making the dangerous journey to Trinidad by boat alone. When she arrived unaccompanied, officials denied her entry, and she was returned to Venezuela, where she was intercepted by sex traffickers, who promised to help her reunite with her mother. She was about seven months pregnant when she called her mother from an unknown beach where she had been brought with others. The lack of comprehensive policies, regulations, operating procedures, and transparent processes are rampant, producing confusion and a lack of accountability, placing children at higher risks of violence, exploitation, and abuse. Some policies also perpetuate exclusion. For instance, 75% of the children who have been in Trinidad and Tobago for more than a year still did not have access to formal education. And even under the imminent registration policy for Venezuelans, children will still not have the right to education training or other government services. Children are also exposed to their parents' struggles and traumas. Over half of Venezuelan migrants complained about being discriminated against due to their nationality. And in 8% of these cases, people suffered physical violence. While men are increasingly stigmatized as criminals, women are labeled as hypersexual and face prejudice, discrimination, harassment, and assault. The intersections of gender and nationality make Venezuelan women prime targets, and precarious immigration status fuels the fire which has no bounds. One mother's breaking point was being aggressively propositioned in front of her young daughter while going to the grocery, and then called a Venezuelan whore when she ignored her assailants. In another case, a security guard hit a young woman who had rebuffed his advances. Emboldened by the stereotype of Venezuelan women and the vulnerability of their precarious immigration status, he ignored the facts that this person had a husband, had a toddler, she was in the late stages of her pregnancy, and that her family was living and working on the farm he was guarding. Fear and shame keep many women, particularly those with children, indoors. Verbal assaults and harassment are prolific and seemingly condoned in the absence of any recourse or support that protects the rights of women and girls, regardless of immigration status, to live free of violence and abuse. Vulnerabilities also exist within the residents. 40% of the Venezuelans with dependents rented a room only, and over 70% said their accommodation offered no privacy. 
For example, families with minor children may live in congested conditions, sharing a bedroom or sleeping area with unrelated people. A mother and child I visited took turns sleeping on the floor of the bedroom, so their roommate could sometimes have the bed. In another circumstance, there were 11 people, including four children, in an apartment sleeping on mattresses in the corridors and living room. Children are exposed to conditions of severe social and material stress and risk of abuse. While the IOM found that 2.65% of the women inside family groups they surveyed were pregnant, critically, children were pregnant in 20% of those cases. Fear of detention and deportation haunts migrants and restricts their mobility. It is especially harrowing for young mothers who worry that their detention will effectively strand or orphan their children. One woman made a contingency plan with her landlord for the care of her daughter in case she failed to return home from work. Though extreme, her fear is well-founded. A local woman recently rescued two Venezuelan children aged eight and 10. She found wandering the streets after their aunt, who the children were brought with, was deported. Given the number of Venezuelan children in the country, these may not be isolated cases. Moreover, they epitomize the collateral damage of indiscriminate detention and deportation, and their fate could have been much worse. The director of the counter-trafficking unit identified an increasing number of Venezuelan nationals as victims of trafficking. People in positions of trust are also implicated. In one case, five people, including a pilot and two lawyers, were charged with the illegal adoption of a Venezuelan baby. Police and immigration officials are commonly accused of preying on Venezuelan women, and only isolated cases have been prosecuted. A Venezuelan activist claimed, they pay the men to buy the girls and keep them trafficking all over the place. How you expect to tell Venezuelans to go and make a report to the police, and you know when you go to the police, they put you in jail and beat you down, and they throw in the cell and cursing you. Over the past year, the following news reports corroborate migrants' claims. Four Venezuelan women were held captive and raped in a house painted to resemble a police station. A police officer is committed to stand trial for human trafficking. Another special reserve police officer was amongst four men arrested for kidnapping a Venezuelan woman. During a rights protest and petition to the government to hear their pleas for help, a young Venezuelan woman told the television news about her ordeal as a victim of a sex trafficking ring with ties to a local police station. And immigration officers are accused of demanding money from families seeking to visit detainees and sexually abusing male and female detainees, which the national security minister promised to investigate. Finally, Venezuelans describe police barging into their private dwellings, subjecting them to racial profiling and document checks, showing disdain or disregard for asylum seeker or refugee status, and subjecting them to fines and detention while also failing to communicate effectively their rights in the process. Moreover, they claim their ability to address their legal rights are obstructed when phone calls are denied or limited, and when they are moved between police stations or between prisons, including maximum security prison, without informing the UNHCR, their lawyers, or family. The following detention conditions were noted in Parliament. Medical complaints and referrals were addressed slowly, which complicated injuries and untreated conditions. And at a point, pregnant women were in detention for weeks without medical care. There was no provision for psychological counseling or counseling related to deportation. There was an insufficient and poor quality diet, limited drinking water, poor sanitation and hygiene, and limited exposure to daylight and fresh air for only one to two hours per day on fair days. Phone calls were restricted. Children couldn't visit the center to see parents. Recognized refugees were detained amongst hundreds of others who were registered asylum seekers or intending to seek Asylum. Intentions to claim asylum were not referred to the UNHCR, international rights organizations, as well as the UNHCR, had difficulty accessing detention centers. There was a lack of interpreters on staff to help migrants communicate their needs and issues, 
and no independent investigations were conducted when staff were accused of bullying or brutality, all of which just scratch the surface of the Venezuelan experience in Trinidad and Tobago. Strengthening the rights regime of the state is a coordinated multi-stakeholder effort and on the rare occasion when the state condemns xenophobia and hate speech and exploitation, as it did in the newspapers yesterday, it is an encouraging sign that we can work collaboratively towards rights-based sustainable development for the nation. In public spaces, private places, in institutions and the media, recognizing the humanity of the non-national will help us to recognize our own humanity. Since 1956, the Family Planning Association of Trinidad and Tobago, FPAT, an NGO, has been working to improve the country's sexual and reproductive health and rights landscape. FPAT consists of five clinics, including four static clinics and a mobile outreach program, serving a minimum of 7,000 unique clients a year who benefit from an average of 78,000 sexual and reproductive health services. Our static clinics were deliberately designed to foster the feeling of safety, confidentiality, and high-quality service to reach vulnerable, marginalized groups. In 2014, FPAT officially began working with migrant groups, including but not limited to Venezuelans. Since then, we've established ourselves as providers of safe, non-stigmatizing, and non-discriminating spaces to access healthcare services delivered by trusted, reliable healthcare providers meeting needs not provided or provided inadequately by the state. Additionally, FPAT undertakes outreach services delivered through our 40 feet mobile clinic, which is outfitted to provide a cadre of sexual and reproductive health services and or we work with clients to identify a space at the client's location. In addition to direct clinic services, in order to reach migrants, FPAT uses a peer-to-peer -peer engagement system, using peers who are either trusted associates or who are members of migrant groups. These peers act as conduits to build and bridge the demand and access to life-saving sexual and reproductive health services. Peer navigation is a positive health-seeking body system whereby an HIV-positive client, for example, is assigned a navigator who works with a patient to enroll into one, an established treatment site, and to remain adherent to their prescribed treatment plan. In addition to supporting access to medical services and support, the peer navigator slash educator, PNE, provides basic psychosocial support, which will include being a confidant, advocate, life coach, and providing technical direction to attain welfare support where needed. Coupled with the PNE is a migrant liaison, someone from the migrant population that they identify with, are able to communicate with in their own language and parlance, and have their needs heard and documented. The migrant liaison is the first line of interaction at, FAP, at FPAT. This interaction allows for the building of trust and makes the delivery of service easier for both client and practitioner. Where needed, the migrant liaison also expedites emergency cases to facilitate quick decisions and or action. These strategies have facilitated efficient service and quickly fed through the migrant social networks and within a short period of time, FPAT was deemed a, a trusted service provider. Through these mechanisms, we have been able to be both a first-hand observer and service provider for the influx of Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad and Tobago. Good health and well-being is an important concern in the Venezuelan migrant scenario. FPAT has seen firsthand that although Trinidad and Tobago provides an open-door public health system, access to basic medical care by migrants is often met with difficulty. In situations where secondary healthcare is needed, even with emergency cases, the situation is worse as access is limited or denied because of the patient's migrant status. The World Health Organization contends that there is a common misconception of an association between migration and the importation of diseases, particularly infectious diseases. In fact, 
the health problems of migrants are similar to the rest of the population. What is true, however, is that the rates of some of these health issues may present with higher prevalence among migrants because they now live in a host country under more vulnerable conditions. Significantly, FPAT has documented that Venezuelan female migrants are more vulnerable to sexual and reproductive health problems and exposure to violence, including sexual violence. Johanna Doe is a Venezuelan migrant that fled to Trinidad and Tobago with her husband, seeking asylum, resettlement in another country for better quality of life. She lives on a farm in a rural part of Trinidad, awaiting resettlement in another country. She and her husband are usually alone, and word traveled that they are illegal Venezuelans staying on the farm and garden. One night, a group of men charged their residence, violently battered the husband, and took Johanna away where she was gang raped and returned to their residence. Johanna, Johanna and her husband contacted their satellite leader, a trusted Venezuelan, for assistance. The satellite leader contacted FPAT's migrant liaison, who immediately actioned our emergency protocol. This included direct transport to and from our clinic, emergency sexual and reproductive health services, including post-exposure prophylaxis, delivered through FPAT's MOU with an HIV treatment site, sexually transmitted infection screens, counseling, and other social, psychosocial support services. Johanna Doe's case is one example of what seems to be an increasing occurrence and reality. FPAT has received many such cases of women being grievously sexually assaulted. FPAT attempted to provide support to Johanna to make a police report. However, Johanna was fearful of being treated as the person who inflicted harm instead of the victim. Part of this fear was the fear of being deported, sent back to a situation that she ran from in the first place. So, to avoid the risk of making a bad situation worse, from Johanna's standpoint, silence appears to be the safer path. She was also fearful of and adamant that her husband not be made aware that she was sexually assaulted. Preface on these realities and because of the structural obstacles faced by Venezuelan migrants wanting to access services for their most important sexual and reproductive health issues, HIV AIDS, cervical cancer, gender-based violence, prostate cancer, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, FPAT provides life-saving responses to Venezuelan migrants, a population that is currently grossly underserved. While a statement from the Minister of Health declared that migrants were free to access public health services, the reality is that no mechanisms are in place to ensure that migrants who do so are not persecuted, prosecuted, deported, or even detained when they do so by the police because of their current illegal status. This is ultimately why they turned to FPAT. Through the support of international agencies, FPAT was able to deliver these life-saving services to Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad in the period October to December 2018 and January to March 2019. During our project period, our clinic served 462 Venezuelan migrants and we delivered more than 1,446 sexual and reproductive health services. These positive health outcomes did not present without challenges. Migrants continue to present at our clinics with medical and social situations that we currently cannot support. In response, we've continued to liaise with other agencies to prompt a referral pathway in the best attempt to respond to the presenting situations. Unfortunately, the jobs that they hold here present less than humane terms and conditions, and time off is not easily obtained. To enable access to our services, we had to create special clinic times. Hosting clinics after work hours creates opportunities to access health, health services that otherwise they would not have been able to get. Our experience tells us that the state needs to establish adequate mechanisms to treat effectively with these issues, given that the NGO sector is not able to completely provide the services needed, at least in a sustainable manner. 
The impact of migration on children is far-reaching. FPAT's experience is that many Venezuelan migrants migrate with their children. As FPAT has become a preferred health service provider, many Venezuelan parents opt to present at our clinics seeking health services for their children. Due to the parameters of FPAT's current migrant project, we are extremely restricted with the services and support that we may, we may provide to Venezuelan migrant children. This is a significant program deficit as many presenting children are afflicted with medical conditions that require immediate healthcare and or secondary healthcare services. Many of the presenting children have not seen a doctor since birth, so they do not have their full complement of required vaccinations. Some of the children are already afflicted with non-communicable diseases and associated medical conditions including diabetes, malnutrition, vision impairment, and hearing problems. State support is needed. We have observed that many children are affected by violence, physical and sexual, perpetrated sometimes by persons they trust, and state responses are poor, if existent. As a migrant, vulnerab vulnerability increases. However, being a child and being a migrant with a language barrier catalyzes that vulnerability. Consequently, migrant children are among the most critical segments of the Venezuelan migrant population that require immediate support to enable them to enjoy basic rights. FPAT is well positioned to continue serving the migrant population. However, Greater efforts are needed to institute an adequate national impact. It is only through strategic partnerships, relationships, and meaningful collaborations that we will be able to holistically address the health needs of migrants in Trinidad and Tobago. Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. This is the time to efficiently appropriate resources, to focus on structure versus stricture, and to allow passion and compassion to lead programmatic delivery. Migrants are not numbers. They too are human beings, deserving the same respect and human rights that we so justly fight for for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to begin by recognizing the petition that was filed by the uh, International Human Rights Law Clinic of uh, the University of the West Indies, led by uh, Professor Bel Antoine, former member of the Inter-American Commission and former president of the Inter-American Commission. The issue that you have brought to, to us has made visible a hidden face of a humanitarian crisis that Venezuelans are suffering but also a hidden face of the migration crisis that the hemisphere and the world is, is, is suffering. I will keep my comments at, uh, for the end. I want to give now the floor uh, to, my, uh, colleague, to my colleague commissioners, and then I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll intervene again. You want to add something? We did have a video, but I know you were generous with our time, so it'll be up to you. It's just one minute long. If you wish. Yes, we, we, let's, go with the, let's go with the video and okay. then uh, we'll respond. Mi nombre es Denny Ventura Alcalá, soy refugiado. Eh, me encontraba en una residencia en San Juan, donde fui tomado, secuestrado prácticamente por la policía. Entraron en una forma sin ningún tipo de documentación. Eh, de ahí me trasladaron a, la, a una módulo policial y fui sentenciado también y me llevaron a la corte eh, donde el juez determinó que aplicaba para un asilo que es esta que está aquí y eso no les paró de migración, me llevaron cuatro meses de prisión en máxima seguridad esperando ir a cumplir la condena en MSP donde me llevaron posteriormente, después me tuvieron seis meses más en IDC, total tuve un año, dos meses, ocho días detenido sin ningún derecho a nada y ni al dur ni Livingota hicieron nada por nosotros. Los que pueden testificar que en la corte de Chaguana se hace cosas indebidas que van en contra de los principios morales y éticos de una persona profesional de la ley, los cuales los mandan 
a la corte chaguara para que, para que paguen una multa y no sean perdonados, pudiendo llevarlos a otras cortes y hacen esa exabruto con las personas de Venezuela. Por favor, le pedimos que tomen consideración con las personas de Venezuela, con los inmigrantes, si venimos escapando de una situación en Venezuela. Thank you. Eh, la comisionada Urrejola, por favor. Um, well, first of all, I also want to thank you for bringing this issue to the commission. Um, to be honest, I'm quite overwhelmed with what I have heard. I agree with Commissioner Joel um, that you have put in front of us a situation that is um, is not on the public face. Um, as a rapporteur of Trinidad and Tobago, um, it's very disappointing that the state is not here today. Um, what we have heard today, uh, the testimonies I have heard, especially uh, personally regarding you know the situation of children you gave a few examples of um, testimonies that are really overwhelming I mean one tries to imagine the situation of those parents that those mothers and it's it's overwhelming me overwhelming sorry overwhelming um, I really regret the state is not here today I think it was a very good opportunity to be able to discuss the situation. I can understand that for the state of Trinidad and Tobago to have this number of migrants from Venezuela is not easy. It is a problem. I assume also that the, you have a problem with the, uh, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, it's a situation we see in, in every other country in the region, and I, and I can understand that. But it's unfortunate that we that the state missed an opportunity to discuss and see how we can work together on a humanitarian crisis. Um, I have a lot of questions, but to be honest, the questions are not for you, it's for the state. So really, um, I would like to send a message to the state of Trinidad. Um, it's very unfortunate that they are not here today, especially when we're doing the hearings in Jamaica. The commission this, um, decided it was a great opportunity to do hearings in a Caribbean country, especially because we wanted to be nearer the Caribbean countries and the Caribbean states. So I, really my statement has to do with the absence of the state today. And the questions I have, I will, would like to discuss them with my fellow commissioners to send a, a letter of Article 421. I think we have to do this after this um, hearing. And I want to thank you again for all the precious information you have given us to put it in, in front of the international community. And you, you have engaged us. I think I can talk for the rest of the commissioners. I think we have to be more proactive on the situation of the Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago. So thank you very much. Gracias, Commissioner. Commissioner Vargas. Sí, muchas gracias, señor presidente, y mi agradecimiento tanto a la profesora Anton Bell por la investigación que ha estado liderando aquí en la universidad, como a quienes llegan en representación de sociedad civil. Yo también me uno a, a ese lamento de ver la silla vacía de un Estado que sí debería realmente responder por estas denuncias que se han formulado, que son tan dramáticas, tan serias, tan documentadas, y que denotan una situación absolutamente dramática respecto de los migrantes venezolanos que están queriendo ingresar a Haití o que han llegado para ver, perdón, a Trinidad y Tobago para ver vulnerados sus eh, derechos de manera tan flagrante. Y más aún en ese estado de vulnerabilidad que nosotros insistimos desde hace varios años en que se encuentra toda la población migrante. A propósito de esto, pues hemos venido advirtiendo también sobre esos discursos de odio que se han venido gestando desde el gobernante número uno, el más poderoso del mundo, el gobernante norteamericano, que son eh, discursos que lamentablemente, bien decía alguien que cuando el coloso del norte estornuda, finalmente contagia a toda América. Y yo creo que ahorita sí que lo estamos viendo de manera 
eh, muy importante. Allí se impulsan políticas xenofóbicas de manera cada día más eh, enojosas, más graves, más dramáticas. Y eso lamentablemente, a pesar de que lo hemos venido denunciando en la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, está haciendo carrera, lamentablemente, y por eso nos duele tanto escuchar estos testimonios y esta, o estas versiones que ustedes nos han suministrado hoy, que reflejan de manera inequívoca que no nos hemos equivocado cuando decimos que no hay población más vulnerable que la de los migrantes. Y en este caso nos duele mucho la de los migrantes venezolanos. Por eso también, por supuesto, que tengo que censurar de manera muy dramática y muy acre, muy eh, urticante, esa doble moral de un gobierno que utiliza la crisis venezolana para su propio beneficio, pero que no hace absolutamente nada para tratar de que se remedien estas eh, situaciones tan graves que se presentan contra los migrantes venezolanos. De manera que para sus intereses particulares, entonces es bueno el tema de la, el drama que genera la migración venezolana, la situación interna de Venezuela, pero no le importa para nada la situación real de los migrantes y lo que con ellos ocurra. A mí la verdad sí me gustaría que esa eh, historia de Joana Dow y todo lo que ustedes nos han narrado en general, porque es demasiado, demasiado todo lo que nos han contado, ojalá y le llegue al Consejo Permanente de la OEA, que realmente allí se discuta, si tanto se discute la situación de Venezuela, si tanto se interesan por la situación de Venezuela, ¿por qué no se interesan por la situación de los venezolanos migrantes? ¿Por qué razón los abandonan de esta manera a su suerte? ¿Por qué permiten que existan en muchos países violaciones de derechos humanos de semejante magnitud? ¿Por qué no les importa para nada que los derechos sexuales y reproductivos de la mujer queden en, en riesgo, que esto ocurra con los niños, niñas y adolescentes venezolanos, integrantes de familias que son separadas, desintegradas, incluso por las propias políticas públicas de Estados Unidos, que se están presentando cada día con más frecuencia, y que, sin embargo, tengan, eh, yo diría que el cinismo de decir que les interesa la situación de Venezuela. En el fondo no les está inter interesando para nada la situación de Venezuela, de los venezolanos. Interesan de pronto otras cosas de carácter económico y eso es muy grave. Es la utilización perversa del drama de los venezolanos para beneficio particular, pero no realmente para que esto quede superado. De manera que... Es una lástima porque, como acaba de decir la comisionada Antonia, sí teníamos un mínimo, un decálogo de preguntas muy concretas para el Estado de Trinidad y Tobago y, y por eso lamentamos tanto eh, que no se hayan presentado el día de hoy. Eh, particularmente me, me llama muchísimo la atención el tema de la huelga de sangre que ha tenido que presentarse en ese país y que denota con claridad que la situación es supremamente grave y que nadie quiere realmente prestarle atención. Como también me llama la atención el hecho de que haya autoridades del Estado de Trinidad y Tobago, empezando por sus propios jueces, que no lo puedo concebir, que eh, expresen esa ignorancia con respecto a, a definiciones que están en los estándares interamericanos, que están en los estándares internacionales y que ni siquiera por vía de Google las bajen para que las apliquen a sus decisiones, como ha eh, denunciado la profesora Antonbal, Antonbal y, la, y la, la investigación que ha hecho con su universidad. Eh, que la propia policía y los... Eh, funcionarios que deberían atender hacia la salvaguarda de los intereses de la población 
eh, venezolana, como personas que llegan, eh, sean casi que auspiciadores de que esto siga ocurriendo. Y vuelvo al tema de la doble moral. Nosotros de pronto admiramos o se admira a un líder tan carismático como Francisco, el Papa. Pero resulta que ese emblemático discurso que dio al comienzo del año sobre la necesidad de que nosotros practiquemos el asilo que le debemos a las personas que están en necesidad, realmente no lo cumplamos, ni nos importe si se está cumpliendo o no se está cumpliendo. Entonces, hay quienes se dicen católicos para unas cosas, pero cuando se trata de eh, cumplir los mandatos y casi nada orientados por el Papa Francisco, eh, no importa para nada, ahí sí no se escucha, no se oye padre como en el cuento. De manera que eh, me parece muy, muy doloroso escuchar todo esto y por supuesto que yo creo que esto tenemos que consignarlo en el informe final de este año de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos con relación a Trinidad y Tobago, ya que no quisieron atender la eh, invitación que se le había surtido para que ojalá nos hubieran ayudado a tratar de superar estas situaciones. De manera que las felicito a ustedes, les agradezco muchísimo que hayan eh, tenido la interés de venir acá a enfrentar esta situación a nombre de la migración venezolana y la verdad que sí me agradaría que de alguna manera ustedes hicieran llegar a hacer conocer esto de la OEA, de su Consejo Permanente y que allí, al seno de ella, también se discuta la situación de derechos humanos, porque solamente el día que logremos que el tema de los migrantes en general, en particular ahorita de los migrantes venezolanos, eh, sean atendidos desde un enfoque de derecho, de reconocimiento de sus derechos como seres humanos, ese día realmente podremos sacar adelante las cosas. Pero de, de lo contrario, estamos eh, cada día más en desventaja y más de para atrás. Es decir, estamos retrocediendo en lo muy poco que habíamos avanzado. Muchísimas gracias, presidente. Gracias, comisionado. El comisionado Eguiguren. Sí, buenos días a todas, a todos. No pensaba hacer ya un comentario, pero eh, yo soy relator para Venezuela, entre otras cosas. Y sí tenía muchísimo interés en escuchar en esta audiencia, bueno, agradezco a la clínica jurídica de esta universidad por la tan valiosa, documentada y a la vez dramática información que nos han proporcionado. Y claro, como ya dijeron mis colegas, uno siente mucho más la ausencia de aquí, de la presencia del Estado, de Trinidad y Tobago, para responder, para explicar, o sea, nos quedamos con el conocimiento de toda esta valiosa información, toda esta denuncia y sin una respuesta. Y por eso la Comisión suele usar lenguajes como expresar su preocupación, lamentar. No, yo en este caso no voy a lamentar. Yo voy a cuestionar severamente, repudiar la falta de presencia del Estado de Trinidad y Tobago aquí. No sé qué razones habrán tenido, entiendo que hay una nota seguramente, pero no hay explicación ni hay excusa. La comisión viene desde lejos porque quiere estar más cerca de los países del Caribe. Gasta recursos económicos, porque este viaje lo pagamos la comisión, y el tiempo y la presencia de todos nosotros. Y es muy malo para esta mañana que las dos primeras audiencias en esta sala, el Estado de Nicaragua, primero, lo que no es muy nuevo, y el Estado de Trinidad y Tobago, simplemente no estén aquí y no pase nada. Entonces sí, creo que debemos ser severos, creo que estos hechos, sin duda, en nuestro eh, informe final de este periodo de sesiones, constará, pero creo que efectivamente es tiempo que el Consejo Permanente de la OEA llame la atención a los estados que incumplen sus obligaciones de no participar a audiencias que se les citan con mucha anticipación. Y finalmente, claro, preocupa mucho la situación de los migrantes venezolanos. Es cierto, es un fenómeno que trastorna la vida habitual de los estados, 
pero en muchos países del continente se vienen haciendo esfuerzos de concertación entre ellos y de acogida y de apoyo. Y llama mucho la atención e indigna que en un país con tanta cercanía geográfica como puede ser Trinidad y Tobago, pues se escuchen y se conozcan estas cosas, ¿no? que las pobres personas que huyen desesperados a una crisis humanitaria en Venezuela esperando una situación mejor, pasen de un calvario a otro. Muy lamentable realmente y muy indignante esta ausencia del Estado. Gracias. Gra gracias, comisionado. Estamos agotando ya el tiempo. Yo sí quisiera, sin embargo, si ustedes me lo permiten, eh, transmitir algunas palabras, porque estoy tan abrumado, tan con congojado como mis colegas. Eh, más allá de la muy lamentable ausencia eh, de del Estado, por la situación de crisis humanitaria que ustedes nos han nos han presentado. Y reconocí ya el trabajo de la Clínica de Derechos Humanos de la Universidad de West Indies, pero también quiero reconocer ahora el trabajo que viene realizando EFPA a favor de los migrantes, a favor de la gente que necesita ayuda y a favor de la gente que no ha encontrado el apoyo en las autoridades y que recurre a la sociedad civil para, para poder sobrevivir sobrevivir en situaciones realmente desesperantes. Eh, mis colegas, y hago mío el, el enojo ya, ya expresado por la ausencia del Estado, pero mi intervención quiere más bien dirigirse hacia las medidas que podemos tomar de manera conjunta, sociedad civil eh, y la Comisión Interamericana. La Comisión Interamericana tiene una responsabilidad de monitorear la situación de los derechos humanos en la región, pero también tiene a su alcance otros instrumentos para la defensa y, y, y protección de los derechos humanos. Aquí, ustedes lo conocen y estoy seguro además, que eh, teniendo a la profesora Bela Antoine en, en la Universidad de West Indies, la, la, la clínica puede desarrollar muchas me, este, medidas eh, con las que cuenta la comisión, como la solicitud de medidas cautelares ¿sí? para la protección, integridad eh, física de este, las víctimas que se encuentran en situación de riesgo. También, eh, al escuchar eh, los casos tan, tan dramáticos que aquí se han expresado, también veo yo eh, violaciones a la Convención Americana de los Derechos Humanos, a la Declaración Americana, que ameritan activar casos ante, ante la, este, la, la, la Comisión. Eh, la, la comisionada Urrejola señalaba la pertinencia de enviar una carta eh, conforme al artículo 41 de la Convención Americana para requerir información. Creo que, sin lugar a dudas, ese es el primer paso que hay que tomar, eh, a pesar de que ya en otras ocasiones, mayo de 2018, también se ha solicitado esta información y a la fecha no hay, no hay este respuesta. No podemos perder de vista que Trinidad y Tobago es un Estado miembro de la OEA, que Trinidad y Tobago eh, es, está bajo la competencia de la Comisión Interamericana y que la Comisión Interamericana tiene dentro de, su, de sus eh, bases jurídicas de actuación, la Declaración Americana de, eh, de los Derechos y Deberes del Hombre, la cual nos da la competencia para actuar plenamente en esta situación. Eh, quisiera darle una, eh, si ustedes quieren hacer algunos eh, comentarios finales, contamos aún con, un muy, eh, con tres minutos a nuestro alcance, de ser necesario. Uh, we would just like to thank you for your very comprehensive uh, responses and we feel very encouraged because it's not a simple thing, an easy thing to <laughs> come out with these sorts of, and it has been a multidisciplinary effort and a long going effort, including the students from the clinic. And we look forward to the Article 41 let letter. I think that's a really good measure. And uh, I hope that this will, this hearing can be, let us say, a jump start because we did talk about the amnesty, so it, they have started, but we have shown how inadequate that would be when we consider all of the issues. So we, we want to move forward in a collaborative way, the clinic and FBAT, to work with the state and with the commission to be able to solve or bring some sort of um, alleviation to these problems. So thank you very much once again for the hearing. Muchas gracias. La audiencia está ter se da por terminar.